in human terms. And David Halberstam, if, if in the past, if, if we look back to the day of infamy in Pearl Harbor, the next day we were at war against the enemy who we knew, we knew exactly who that enemy was and what we were going to do. Does, does the shadowy nature of this horror make it even tougher to rally it, the it's, it's I don't know it makes it harder, it's harder to sustain. Uh, you can rally, can you sustain? Uh, there's a tendency going back to Pearl Harbor, Japan and Germany, later the Soviets, more recently Slobodan Milosevic, to underestimate democracies, to underestimate the power of democracies, the, the energy, to think that we're decadent and weak. I think this is a very important moment because I think for the first time the full energies of this nation will be focused on something that has always been a little bit outside our reach, erratic little issues. This is a new kind of era we're in. I think when we put our full energies in there and we perhaps start making some of the surrounding countries and make them offers that they cannot refuse for the people who've harbored uh, uh, this, these terrorist effects. It may be a different era, but I mean, we. this is something, this is a very new a demarcation point. Uh, because we're down to our last minute, I want to show our audience and, and both of you, David, some tape of what remains of the World Trade Center because it brings to mind something that the Senate chaplain said on November 22nd, 1963, when John Kennedy died. He said, we gaze at a vacant space against the sky, which is what all of America and the world is doing now. And then he added, but God lives and the, rep and the government of Washington t still stands. David McCullough, is there any doubt given this country that we will, in, in the most important sense, get through the horror that we are witnessing now? No, no doubt whatsoever. No doubt whatsoever. We are much stronger, much more resilient, much more deeply, profoundly, truly patriotic country than we like to admit. And it's going to change the whole nature of what happens in this city of Washington in the next several days and probably for years to come. And uh, we, um, I was reminded today of uh, something Churchill said during the war when he came across the Atlantic. I think he said it in Canada, but he was speaking but for both the Canadian and the American people. He said, we haven't journeyed this far because we're made of sugar candy. That's true also, David Havelstam is a New Yorker of the city. That well, this is a very in. gritty city. You don't become a New Yorker and stay here if you are soft of tissue. I think one of the great things, it would be a great mistake to underestimate the resilience of this country, the city. I mean, I think there's such strength. Uh, we didn't get to where we are. We didn't become a beacon for so much of the rest of the world. We didn't get that Dow Jones and all these other qualities out of nothing. David McCulloch in Washington, David Halberstam here in New York, thank you very much for joining us. I just thought it would help a bit at the end of this very long and horrible day to get some historical perspective on this event and realize that this country has been through a great deal and we've made it so far and we'll make it again. I'm Jeff Greenfield in New York and to take us through the rest of the evening, we go to Atlanta now with Jim Clancy and Colleen McEdwards. Lady, gentlemen, it's all yours. It is midnight in New York, marking the end of a day that will forever change the city's skyline and forever change any notion of America's isolation, its safety in an increasingly dangerous world. Cameras capture the horror as the North Tower of the World Trade Center is rocked by a plane crash and watch as another plane enters the picture plowing into the South Tower. New York gripped by chaos, and many fear the worst, with reports of thousands missing and presumed dead. And the U.S. Capitol shares in New York's misery as a hijacked plane strikes at the nerve center of America's military might. Hello from CNN Center, I'm Jim Clancy. And I'm Colleen McEdwards. Our coverage of America under attack continues. Ahead, we'll go live to the scenes of the devastation. But first, let's revisit the appalling events that transfixed America and the world on Tuesday, September the 11th. United States President George W. Bush saying he's commanded an all-out search for whoever was behind a series of attacks on U.S. soil Tuesday. The president convened a late-night meeting of his National Security Council after a harrowing day of death, 
destruction, and disbelief. The perpetrators aim squarely at symbols of the economic and military power of the United States. The first of many shocks at the start of the workday in New York's financial district. Trade Center. And then it was just about 18 minutes after that attack, another plane appears and also flies directly into the second of the Twin Towers. That aircraft later identified as a Boeing 757 belonging to United Airlines. It had been hijacked while it was en route from Boston to Los Angeles. Now the, the two planes had at least 148 people on board. Thousands of people were believed to be in the Twin Towers at the very moment of the attacks, as you see here. Now, the back-to-back -back attacks on the Twin Towers seemed unthinkable. Unthinkable, yes, but then incredibly, it was a method of attack that was to be repeated. Just about an hour after the first explosion in New York, the Pentagon, the hub of the U.S. military, was hit by a third passenger jet. This, an American Airlines flight that had just taken off from Washington's Dulles Airport with 64 people on board. Smoke and flames rose from a section of the Pentagon that contained U.S. Army offices. That section of the building later collapsed, but it could have been worse. We're fortunate in this part of the building in that the part of the, where the plane hit, one part of it was just beginning to be occupied. As areas had just been renovated. So part of it was occupied, but not all of it. And then the other, other area adjacent to that, more behind the heliport uh, station there, uh, some of those areas were, were people, the people had moved out to move to what we call the new Wedge 1 area. So some areas were not occupied to begin with. All right, the Pentagon attack prompted a heightened security alert right across the U.S. Capitol. The White House Justice Department, State Department and other federal buildings were all evacuated. Tourist sites were also closed. All right, and as we follow things, as events uncovered on the ground, emergency services were racing to the Pentagon. Meantime, the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center had become blazing beacons. Shortly before 10 o'clock Eastern Time, the first of the towers collapsed. It created a fog of dust and smoke and showering lower Manhattan with glass and other debris. Half an hour later, the second tower then gave way. Its steel and concrete core melted by tons upon tons of burning aviation fuel. A tornado of dust and debris sent people literally running for their lives. The buildings that had so much defined the New York skyline for a generation and taken six years to build were gone in less than two hours. Now, at this point, rumors were flying. There were, were false reports of car bombings, fires, and a second plane that was headed towards the Pentagon at yeah, that hour. As is the case when things are on unfolding. But one report actually did prove to be true, the crash of a fourth passenger plane. This one in a wooded area of Pennsylvania. Military sources denied that it had been shot down. Intelligence sources say they have some evidence that United Airlines Flight 93 was being diverted to Camp David. That's a presidential retreat in Maryland. Local emergency officials say they received a phone call from a man who identified himself as a passenger of the flight en route to San Francisco from Newark. The caller said the plane was being hijacked, crashed about 10 minutes later. 45 people were on board that flight. In New York, rescue crews are working through the night through deep rubble from several collapsed buildings. They are now looking for any survivors. There are reports that some cell phone calls are coming actually from beneath the debris. We're still hopeful that we're going to that we're going to find people, and, and we, we have do, not we have not given up hope that we're going to we're going to be able to find some people. We we do know there are people in the building that are alive. We know that for a fact. Uh, I can't get into it right now, but we do know there are people in the building that are alive, uh, and we're making every effort to get to them. Well, the total number of dead will not likely be known for days because of the devastation here. President Bush says. Thousands of lives were lost. Officials in New York say at least 300 firefighters are feared dead in the collapse of the Twin Towers. 78 police officers at this point confirmed missing. And one insurance brokerage firm that operated in the World Trade Center says that only about 500 of its 1,700 workers have been accounted for. Officials at the Pentagon say as many as 800 employees may have been killed there. At least 60 injured people were being treated at hospitals in the Washington area. 
Now, the four plane crashes alone took some 250 lives, including some notable names, among them the man who created the hit television sitcoms, Frasier, and produced Cheers. David Angel and his wife were apparently aboard one of the planes that crashed into the Twin Towers. Jim? The drama continues as well in Lower Manhattan this night. We're going to go to Rose Arce. She is there. She's a CNN producer who's been following this story. Rose, give us a picture of the scene. I'm standing right across the street from Two World Trade Center, which right now is, is about seven stories high. It's just been completely shaved off at the top. And what is left of the seven stories is, is the whole front end is just shaved right off the front of the building. You can almost see through it. There's also a walkway that connected to World Trade Center to, to the other side of the street. That walkway is completely flattened. And right next to me on the street are a line of fire trucks that have just been crushed. I, one has a piece of the World Trade Center on it. It's, it's uh, jutting. The piece of the World Trade Center is just jutting from the cab of the fire truck. And, and there's several others behind it that are also just completely crushed. One is on its side. There's also there's a steady stream of rescue workers with uh, what looks to be very heavy construction material trying to clear out debris and clear a pathway so they can get in, get in a little bit closer to that building. All right, Rose, thanks very much. And, of course, just a reminder, we are hearing reports that there have actually been some cell phone calls made possibly from the basement there of, of the, the, the World Trade Center. We want to go uh, to another part of New York now where Garrick Utley is for his thoughts about this terrible day. Garrick, some perspective for us, will you? Well, the perspective is the very painful reality, Colleen, as we've been seeing all day and now into the evening. It's said, of course, that New York City is the city that never sleeps. And never has that been more true than on this evening or actually now in the early morning hours of the day after, except the pain still reverberates here through the entire city. It's strange around here. It's dark. Of course, it's the void of night. And yet there's this eerie quiet, not just downtown where people are not allowed to go past police barriers, but here in Midtown, the streets are empty. Times Square normally jammed with people in traffic at this hour, coming out of theaters or restaurants or movies. Uh, there, there's nobody there. I was coming down Fifth Avenue tonight on a bus, the only way to get around town. Uh, nobody there. Uh, Manhattan, of course, is an island, and in the way this, this island has now pulled up its drawbridges, uh, at least, uh, if not literally, metaphorically. Uh, the tunnels in and out of town, the Lincoln Tunnel and the uh, Holland Tunnel have been closed to traffic. The bridges are closed to vehicular traffic. Only the George Washington Bridge has one lane open uh, for outgoing traffic, nothing coming inbound. But to give you an idea of how jittery people and police are here, uh, bomb squads are everywhere, racing around the, uh, the city, checking out every suspicious vehicle. In fact, one on the George Washington Bridge are trying to approach the George Washington Bridge was stopped and searched. They thought they had something there. It turns out to have been a false alarm. But everybody is working 24 hours uh, through this evening. Let's look again at some of the scenes we had today. Uh, what we've gone through here in, in Manhattan is really four stages. First, there was the terror of the attack. Uh, We've been seeing these all day long. The pictures speak for themselves, the rubble that is there. The two planes, one at 8.45 a.m., 18 minutes later, the second jet plowing into the, the uh, those giant towers at the lower end of Manhattan. And, and, and scenes like this, not just on the street, but in buildings, places where people worked in stores there. There are the mannequins covered with dust, and of course the people covered with dust. And right after this initial terror came more of the aftermath. Um, the, the survivors, uh, the people being hauled out, uh, traumatized, wounded, people trying to get in touch with their loved ones, a great jostling to get to public telephones to call home to tell their loved ones that, that they were safe, if they were among the fortunate few uh, who were safe on this day. And then, of course, came the job of taking those who could be taken to hospitals. Uh, hospitals are, are jammed here. Uh, at least 1,500 people, um, according to the latest official reports, um, uh, have been taken into hospital. More than 2,000 are being treated or have been treated in triage centers set up around town, including the, uh, the Statue of Liberty in, in New York City Harbor. Uh, Mayor Giuliani, uh, as other officials, is not even trying to give an estimate of the death toll, but he did say, quote, when we get the final numbers, they will be more than we can bear. He said it's horrendous the number of lives lost. For example, 300 policemen, perhaps even more, are missing and feared lost in the collapse of the towers. 
And, um, and, Garrick, and that's Garrick, just, if yes. I can, let me interrupt you. This is Jim yes. Clancy. Let me just interrupt you for a minute Please. because we have a new piece of footage that has come in that gives us another perspective, yet another perspective of the tragedy as it was literally unfolding this day, showing that second plane from a different angle as it slammed into the... That was they were uh, rewinding the tape there, but an incredible angle showing that plane as it came in very low. You could see how low it was. Apparently, there from Battery Park, taking a look. Uh, can we roll it again, please? We've seen it from the front angle before, but not from this angle. Utley, I, I want to ask you something. As we look at these pictures, and we've looked at these pictures over and over again, and it affects not just the people that are in the United States that have been there in New York, but literally all around the world. Buildings, yes, they can be rebuilt, but there seems to be something in the psyche that may have been changed by the events of this day, such as the magnitude of what we've witnessed. There's no question about this, Jim. Uh, whether you're here in Manhattan and, and you saw that as an eyewitness or whether you're on the opposite side of this world watching it via satellite at this moment, it's not, they're never the same pictures. Each one is this new experience again, whether we're just seeing the same picture two or three times or something new like that. And I'm sure more pictures and images will be coming from various sources in the hours and the, and the days to come. What, what really strikes you though, and I think strikes any journalist or any, any person down on the street, is, is not just what we saw with that plane going into that tower and the horror of it, but trying to think, each of us, throughout this day, what were the people in that plane going through? Who was in that tower where those flames and smoke are right now, having their morning coffee in a styrofoam cup, looking out across beautiful New York Harbor on a cloudless day and seeing this jet? Nothing more to say, just watch. Nothing more to say, except just one detail, uh, which I think has been reported, but I might offer some clarity, Jim and Colleen. Uh, that was the second plane that uh, struck the trade of the t uh, towers. It came from the south over New York Harbor, which is the normal direction the planes approach for landings at LaGuardia Airport. Planes coming into Kennedy don't fly over Manhattan. Planes coming into LaGuardia do fly up the Hudson River on this side or the East River on that side. So a plane coming from the south, you'd say he's off course, but that's the way planes do make their approach. But that first plane at 8.45 this morning, it came from the other direction. It was going up a one-way street, so to speak. It came from the north, which is here, straight down over the center of Manhattan into that tower. We saw that image uh, just a few minutes ago. So it was going against traffic. Everybody who looked up and caught a glimpse of that plane flying at hundreds of miles of hour in Manhattan knew instantly something was wrong. That plane had no business being there, but well, it was, and well, that's the result. Garrick, as awful and, and as horrendous as what, what this country has seen, what the world has seen already today, I suppose come daylight tomorrow when day starts breaking uh, behind you there, it starts to get really grim, doesn't it? Because people may get a, a better sense of the devastation, a better sense of the toll in terms of human life. Well, we don't know when officials will start to make any kind of an estimate on uh, how many lives have been lost. The search, of course, will begin. Uh, it's going to be long and arduous because we've seen how much rubble is down there, and nobody's even guessing how long it'll take to go through the rubble. One way of approaching a figure of, of human loss will be by taking a survey or an inventory, a census, if you will. Um, each company, each floor had offices, companies, uh, people working there. They know how many employees were there. They know who didn't come home. That's the kind of, of statistics, the numbers, the body count, sad to say, that'll be made starting tomorrow morning. Back to you. Garrett Cutley, thanks. Thanks for that, Garrett. Well, of course, President Bush was in Florida at the time of the attacks. For security reasons, he did not return to Washington, at least at first. Instead, Air Force One flew to an Air Force base in Louisiana and then on to another in Nebraska. Then at dusk, the president finally returned to Washington, his plane accompanied by jet fighters. 
At the White House, he addressed a nation traumatized by a day of tragedy. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. This has undoubtedly been the toughest day of the administration of George W. Bush without question. John King has been there at the White House throughout the day. He joins us now. John. Well, Jim, President Bush at sleep tonight. At least the White House lights have been turned off, but we are told to look first thing in the morning for more efforts at sending reassuring signs from the president to the American people. He will bring a bipartisan group of the leadership of Congress to the White House and make another public statement. The president, immediately after he finished that televised address to the American people tonight, convened a meeting of the National Security Council, getting an update on U.S. troop deployments, getting an update on what the government knows about these terrorist strikes today, also included in that meeting an extraordinary meeting because of the extraordinary circumstances here today the transportation secretary the health and human services secretary the director of the federal emergency management agency they are now directing the government's response portable morgue sent up to the streets of new york a grim sign there deployment by the thousands of search and rescue teams medical personnel around the country the administration on the one hand reacting to these tragedies today by sending out emergency help on the other hand trying to look ahead. We are told by sources that senior administration officials have told key members of Congress that they are confident that they are developing evidence linking these attacks to organizations and people associated with the suspected terrorist Osama bin Laden. Publicly, the administration not saying that. This from private briefings to key members of Congress. But we do know in the president's remarks tonight to the American people, he said that the administration would not differentiate at all between terrorists and those who gave them harbor. The president will meet with his national security team again tomorrow. Secretary of State Powell out in public again in the morning as the administration, on the one hand, responds to this, and on the other hand, tries to decide what to do about it. Jim. John King, as the investigation moves forward, and we know that's got to take its course, but when Americans wake up in the morning, will something have changed? Will they see a difference? The White House certainly believes so. One of the reasons the president wanted to get back to the White House tonight, despite the security concerns, was to give a reassuring address to the American people. And certainly the symbolism of the president returning to Washington was important to the White House. Any Americans, we are told as of right now, the plan is to reopen the domestic air, commercial air system in the United States at noon tomorrow. But any American going to an airport in this country, to a major train station in this country, will see heightened security. No more checking your luggage at the curbside, a luxury enjoyed at most American airports. We are told there will be more random searches, more security personnel. The question is whether this is a permanent change of culture here or one that will fade in the weeks and months ahead. But certainly the country will awaken tomorrow still trying to count the numbers of those dead and injured, still trying to get an explanation from the president and other federal officials as to how this could have happened, four commercial airline liners hijacked in the same day, what the administration is doing about it, the status of the investigation, and possible retaliation. Jim. John, we saw earlier in the day the concerns for the safety of the president. Are those concerns going to remain in place? Certainly, we are seeing on the streets of Washington, around the White House complex, extraordinary security measures taken. I was told by two senior officials earlier that there was a paramount concern of getting the president back to Washington because of the important political symbol that would send. But, as you mentioned, the president went first from Florida to a military base in Louisiana. At that point, there were plans to bring him back to Washington. but. The White House was told that not all planes in the skies over the United States has been accounted for, I'm told by sources. At that point, the decision was made not to bring the president back to Washington until all the airliners known to be in the air over the United States were accounted for. It was only then, and then only after they rechecked the White House grounds, rechecked the security of Andrews Air Force Base, and arranged for that extraordinarily close contact fighter escort we just showed our viewers on television there. Only then did they decide to bring the president back to Washington. All right, John King reporting there live 
from the White House. Colleen. All right, Jim, thanks. Let me get some phone numbers to you now. We want to make sure you get these. Airlines have released numbers for people who are concerned about their family members. Relatives of American Airlines passengers seeking information about relatives have have this number to call, 1-800-245, excuse me, 0999. United Airlines says that friends or family members seeking information on flights may call 1-800-932-8555. United also says that it's going to post uh, information on its website. That's www.united. Dot com. Now, the U.S. Justice Department has set up a hotline for families and relatives of those who may have been uh, hurt or killed in these attacks. They're encouraged to call 800-331-0075. Relatives can get information about victims as well as provide authorities with information if they want to. The hotline will also inform survivors of their rights and some of the services that uh, are going to be available to them. The Pentagon also operating a hotline for staff to ring in and register their status. All Army personnel who work at the Pentagon are asked to call 800-984-8523 or 703-428-0002. Uh, now, families seeking information on Army personnel are also asked to call that same number. The number for Navy and Marine Corps personnel, 1-877-633-6777. Seven, two. Jim? There are many people, of course, that are still missing, still unaccounted for, and there are people doing their best to try to locate them, hoping against hope, perhaps, that some are still alive. Deborah Farrick uh, is on the scene. She's about 20 blocks from the uh, actual Battery Park, the area of the uh, Twin Trade Towers, where they used to appear on the skyline there. Let's join her now by telephone. Deborah? Well, Jim, I just spoke to a retired police officer who was at the actual site of the explosion. He was there with his cadaver dog. He said that uh, after about five minutes, the dog couldn't smell anything because the dust is so thick down there. Um, but the way that the uh, officer described the scene, he said that there are big cranes lifting very heavy beams as they sort through some of this debris. There are people from emergency services unit and the fire department. They are using heavy saws to try to cut through whatever they can, trying to find pockets of people who may still be alive. Now, that whole area uh, down by the Trade Center is in total blackout. There are no lights, and uh, it is one of the normally one of the brightest areas of the city, but that is now in total blackout. And uh, one police officer told me that uh, as you get close to the scene, uh, apparently it is lit up like a stadium because they have brought in all of these very powerful floodlights. And as a matter of fact, we saw, I would say, about uh, 20 uh, trucks, flatbed trucks, carrying some of those lights down just about 10 minutes ago. Um, again, police officers, firefighters uh, sorting through the debris. They're trying to find anybody who may still be alive in the rubble. They're lifting beams. They are going through uh, whatever they can. But again, the dogs that they had brought down there to try to find people are effectively useless because it is so difficult to breathe down there. Jim. All right, Deborah Farrick, our thanks to you for bringing us up to date the scene as it continues to develop right down there uh, at the World Trade Center uh, location. Colleen? All right, Jim. Well, U.S. officials regard Osama bin Laden as a prime suspect in the attacks against Washington and New York. He's believed to be in Afghanistan and early on Wednesday morning local time, news of explosions in the Afghan capital, Kabul. Soldiers from the ruling Taliban say the explosions seem to come from a low-flying helicopter firing rockets. The United States swiftly denied any involvement, and CNN's Nick Robertson, who was in Kabul, reported that a rebel group had claimed responsibility for the attacks. A spokesman for the Taliban government de denied that his country allowed bin Laden to strike from its territory. We in Afghanistan do not allow Osama bin Laden to use Afghanistan's territory to launch attacks against any country around the world. We took away all communication devices from him and he does not have any communication with anybody outside of Afghanistan. In any case, we will conduct our own investigation and find out what happened. And we denounce this terrorist attack, whoever is behind it. And while denouncing the attack, the ruling Taliban say that uh, they're going to conduct their own investigation. Now, Osama bin Laden, number one on the FBI's most wanted list. There's a $5 million bounty on his head, as we mentioned, uh, believed to be hiding in Afghanistan. And for more on Osama bin Laden, let's go to Jean Meserve, who is in Washington right now. Jean? 
Colleen, senior administration officials saying in briefings today that they are confident that Osama bin Laden was behind today's events. Why are they saying that? Well, we're going to talk to one of the experts, one of the few Western journalists who has actually met Osama bin Laden, Peter Bergen, writing a book on the man now, also our terrorism analyst. Thanks a lot for coming in. Um, intelligence sources have said repeatedly today they had no hint that this was coming. But you say there was, in fact, some foreshadowing, at least. The Bin Laden organization has a tendency of uh, subtly insinuating actions in coming weeks. Uh, if you think back to the Africa embassy bombings, the two American embassies that were bombed in 1998, Bin Laden had a press conference in Afghanistan uh, two months before the bombing talking about good news in coming weeks. And then the embassy w was bombed. If you remember the USS Cole attack last year in Yemen, um, there was a videotape floating around the Middle East in which uh, bin Laden was wearing a, a Yemeni dagger, which uh, he's never worn in previous photographs. One of, his, one of his aides said we should attack military targets, U.S. military targets in Yemen. Um, and there has been a videotape floating around the Middle East uh, just recently, uh, a two-hour tape, which lays out both bin Laden's general views and the tactics of his organization. And on the tape, bin Laden uh, claims pretty directly responsibility for the coal attack and says, the victory in Yemen is ju just the beginning, calling for attacks on American targets. Uh, so he definitely implied in the videotape future actions. Uh, as a result of those uh, implications, the United States took some efforts in the Middle East uh, to, uh, there was a security warning in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, the embassy in Yemen was closed temporarily. FBI agents investigating the coal were pulled out of the country. Uh, but clearly, uh, there was no indication that something was going to happen here. You said this tape was floating around the Middle East. What do you mean? Well, it was floating around in several. It, 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 emer it uh, emerged in Kuwait in June. Uh, a newspaper got hold of it. But then after that, it was put on the Internet, and it was widely accessible on the Internet. I was able to pull up my own version. Uh, and the tape is quite interesting in terms of the, uh, the things that bin Laden says on it, and certainly the implication of future plans. Why is he the prime suspect in this particular series of events? Um, but partly uh, you've got to ask yourself who has the motive and who has the capability. Obviously he has the motive. He's hated the United States for a long time. And he seems to have the capability. Um, this was obviously a very sophisticated operation. You needed people who were willing to commit suicide. Uh, we've seen sui suicide attacks by his organization in the Africa bombing and the coal bombing. And also you need co needed commercial pilots. Um, and, and did he have those or did he train those, recruit them? Uh, we, we know that in the past he's had commercial pilots on the payroll. He's had his own plane. He flew around from Sudan to Afghanistan. Uh, he was flying from Kenya to Sudan when he lived in that country. So he had at least two pilots capable of flying commercial jets at that time. Now, whether he was able to get four is, is an open question. Now, I heard some other terrorism experts uh, citing some other possible suspects today. They named Iran, Iraq, and possibly some Palestinian factions. Would you cross all of those off your list? Well, I'd hate to cross anybody off the list, but I think in terms of the Palestinians, uh, Palestinians have been very directed at Israeli attacks. If, if this was a Palestinian group, why, would, why didn't they just uh, fly a plane into Ariel Sharon's uh, residence? Uh, Iran has been looking for much closer links with the United States. Quickly, can they find him? Can they punish him, as has been promised by the President of the United States, or is that going to be a very difficult task? It's very hard to find somebody. You need information not about yesterday or even today. You need information about two hours from now, and that's very difficult information to get about some, a particular individual. Peter Bergen, thanks so much for joining us today. And a note about Washington coming in here a few hours ago. The city was absolutely silent. It's very eerie. There's little traffic. There are few pedestrians. Co parts of the city cordoned off. The only thing that is there in great numbers, police. They are out in great force this evening here in the nation's capital. Jim, back to you. Okay. All right, Gene, thanks. So we want to actually show you some of that exclusive video here on CNN. We showed it to you a about 20 angle. minutes ago. Yeah, let's Shows, look at it again. This is the second plane. Watch carefully from the left. That plane hitting the World Trade Center about 20 minutes after the first one. The first one hit just shortly before 9 o'clock, about 10 minutes to. Again, that's a reverse angle, one that we've not seen you, before. And you looked, and earlier we could hear the sounds of the people in Battery Park looking onto this, screaming, uh, just seeing more of this horror unfolding in their city that led to the destruction of a landmark of New York this day and perhaps has forever changed the way Americans are going to look at whether or not they are isolated from the issue of terrorism.
this has changed a lot. Yeah, as one member of government said earlier today, the days of talking about terrorism for the United States, he said, are over. There was a lot of reaction from all around the world, reaction coming in the form of shock, dismay, and sympathy for the American people. Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon declared Wednesday a day of mourning in Israel. Flags there are going to be flown at half-staff, and emergency rescue units are being sent to the United States. The fight against terror is an international struggle of the free world against the forces of darkness who seek to destroy our liberty and our way of life. I believe that together we can defeat these forces of evil. At this most difficult hour, all Israelis stand as one with the American people. Our hearts are with you, and we are ready to provide any assistance at any time. The government of Israel has declared a day of mourning tomorrow as we bow our heads and share in the sorrow of the American people. It's important to note, too, Israel has been on a heightened state of alert. Now, at the same time, Palestinian Authority President Yasser Arafat denouncing the attacks, calling them a crime against humanity. It is very difficult for me personally, for anyone, to speak about what had happened. It is not only against the Americans. It is not only against the American people or against the American government. It is against the, the whole international human being. Unbelievable, unbelievable. I am sending my uh, my condolences for President Bush, for his government for his uh, American people, for this unbelievable disaster what happened. This is touching our hearts. And uh, it's very difficult to, to, to explain my, my feelings, my pain. God help them. God help them. God help them. Arafat offered help in tracking down those responsible. Several radical Palestinian groups, including Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, have denied any involvement. All right, let's talk a little bit now about the reaction in Europe. European leaders unanimous in their condemnation of the attacks. British newspapers all carried pictures on the front page of their morning edition. Messages of condolences and expressions of support poured in. This is not a battle between the United States of America and terrorism, but between the free and democratic world and terrorism. We therefore here in Britain stand shoulder to shoulder with our American friends in this hour of tragedy, and we, like them, will not rest until this evil is driven from our world. It is an impudent challenge thrown down to all humanity, at least to civilized humanity. And what has happened today once again emphasizes actuality of Russia's proposal to unite efforts of the international community to fight with terrorism with this plague of the 21st century. Russia has experienced terrorism, and that is why we exactly understand the feelings of the American people. Addressing the people of the United States on behalf of the people of Russia, I would like to say that we are with you, and we share and feel your pain in full. We support you. With an immense emotion that France vient d'apprendre ces attentats monstrueux. It is with enormous emotion that France has just learned of these monstrous attacks. There is no other word that have struck the United States of America. 
And in these unbelievable circumstances, the entire French people, I can state, are with the American people. I express our friendship and our solidarity in this tragedy. I assure President George Bush, of course, of my total support. France, you know, has always condemned terrorism and condemns it unequivocally and believes it must be fought in every way. That is why I'm asking you to excuse me immediately. I have to return to Paris. This is a Kriegserklärung against the gesamte civilisierte Welt. This is a declaration of war against all civil societies. Whoever helps these terrorists or protects them goes against all fundamental values on which the coexistence of nations is founded. The German people support the American people in this hour that is so difficult for the people in the United States. We remain strongly committed to the United States of America. An act of unspeakable violence took place today. Uh, and this is a moment where people are reflecting on the nature of that tragedy and standing firm against that kind of violence and with the people who have suffered from it. I want to express in name of the European Union our entire solidarity with the United States, with our American friends and with the American uh, people, with our allies. Well, perhaps you can imagine how much the attack on the World Trade Center has unnerved global financial markets already feel fearful of recession. And of course, some of those markets around the world are open now. Richard Quest in London has been monitoring the situation there for us. Richard. Uh, good morning, Colleen. Uh, this was, of course, an attack right on the very heart of the World Center for Capitalism. So it's not surprising that as soon as the news became clear, there were very sharp falls in share prices across Europe. And that's been seen again in Asia overnight. Let me update you briefly. Tokyo's stock market is down around 6.2%. In Hong Kong, the market there down also around 9.5%, following on from what was seen in Europe. The U.S. Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill, he's in Japan at the moment and is to return to the United States. He's had discussions not only with the chairman of the Fed, Alan Greenspan, but with the various securities regulators. Their key goal now, of course, to restore confidence in the system, to maintain confidence in the business and markets of the United States. And to do that, the Fed has made it clear it will pump whatever money is necessary or needed into the system. I understand that discussions have taken place about not only providing cash to ATMs, to banks across the United States, where there may be massive withdrawals of cash from people worried about being able to have access to funds, but also the Fed will be standing behind companies, banks, in, the case, in case there's some form of credit crunch. That's what could cause the recession in the U.S. CNN's Richard Quest, thanks very much in London. Jim? President George W. Bush is trying to calm and reassure the people of the United States as well as his nation's allies. In a televised address, he said America was looking for those responsible for these attacks and those who harbored them. This is the full text of his address. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world. 
and no one will keep that light from shining. Today our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature, and we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C. to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Tonight I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages. All right, we were listening there to uh, President Bush as uh, he spoke directly to the nation from the White House. Clearly, they're trying to uh, allay some of the fears people may have about financial markets and other things, conveying a deep sense of what had happened in the day, a deep sense that he was facing a complete change in the way the U.S. is going to have to deal with one of the major threats it faces, terrorism. For his part, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell rushed back to Washington from South America. He told reporters U.S. officials had received no specific warnings, in his words, in advance of the attacks. You also heard the president uh, making the point that uh, America will be open for business, as he said, including uh, the Pentagon. The rescue and recovery effort, though, continuing into the night at the Pentagon, where American Airlines Flight 77 crashed. CNN's Bob Franken joins us now uh, with more on that. Bob, how's it looking there this evening? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's 15 hours, more than 15 hours, since the plane crashed into this side of the Pentagon. You can see in back of me there's still smoke. The fire is still burning. As a matter of fact, uh, the various firefighters are still in what they're calling a defensive position. They haven't really attacked the interior. They're going to do that with the break of the light of day. They're going to literally peel back the walls, we're saying. Uh, they're going to peel back the walls and go in there and take a very aggressive stance and finally be able to put out a fire, I said, started about uh, 15 hours ago and was witnessed a guest from some people who were driving at the, from the highway right over there. I looked off, uh, I was, you know, looked out my window, I saw this plane, a jet, American Airlines jet coming, and I thought, uh, this doesn't add up, it's really low. And, uh, and I saw it, it just went, I mean, it was like a, a cruise missile with wings, went right there and slammed right into the Pentagon. Huge explosion, a uh, great ball of fire, and smoke started billowing out, and then it was just chaos on the, on the highway as people either tried to move around the traffic and, and go down uh, either forward or backwards. We had a lady who was in front of me who was backing up and screaming, everybody go back, go back, they've hit the Pentagon. There's still no official estimate of casualties. Uh, we're being told now by one of the local fire chiefs that there could be between 100 and 800 deaths inside. Of course, we know there were about 65 people on the plane that actually crashed into the building here. Uh, the Rumsfeld, uh, the defense secretary, held a briefing just a few hours ago, and he was not really able to give many details on casualties. 
it, there, there cannot be any survivors. It, it just would be beyond comprehension. The, um, there are a number of people that they've uh, not identified by name, but identified as being uh, dead, and uh, there are a number of casualties. But uh, we're, the FBI has secured the site, and the um, information takes time to come. People have been uh, lifted out and taken away in ambulances, and uh, the, the numbers will be calculated, and it will not be a few. Now, it's very, very important to the Pentagon that it reopened tomorrow. The defense secretary said he was determined that at least some of the services would be conducted here. There will be an opening of this building, but individuals should check with his supervisor to find out exactly whether he or she should come to work. And some of the work that will certainly be going on today will be very preliminary, preliminary planning, at least, of the ultimate retaliation once they can figure out who it is they're going to retaliate against. Colleen? Understood. Bob Franken at the Pentagon tonight. Thanks very much. Jim? As the United States tries to come to grips with what has happened this day, the magnitude of the tragedy, thousands of people, more than 300 firefighters' families trying to deal with this problem, victims perhaps in their thousands, all trying to deal with missing people or people that are known to have died in the violence. Among those victims in the attack on the Pentagon, a person perhaps familiar to many of you CNN viewers, Barbara Olson, an attorney. She was frequently a commentator here on CNN. Her husband is U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson. He says she called him twice on her cell phone from inside the aircraft telling him that it had been hijacked by men with knives. Barbara Olson was not originally scheduled to take that flight, but she delayed her travel plans to have breakfast with her husband on Tuesday, his birthday. And this is a really disturbing as, as well. A man on board one of the doomed planes actually called his mother uh, as the aircraft was being hijacked. Mark Bingham was a passenger on United Airlines Flight 93 that was en route from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco. Called his mother in the Bay Area minutes before the plane crashed near Pittsburgh. Well, that I love you very, very much in case I don't see you again. I said that that the plane has been taken over by hijackers. And, um, and then I said, well, we love you very much too, Mark. Let me go get your mother. I got on the phone, Mark. Um, and he said, hi, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. <laughs> Give me his last name. And uh, he said, I want to let you know that I love you. And I'm, uh, I'm uh, flying. I'm, I think he said, I'm in the air. I'm calling you uh, on the air phone of the airplane. In his seat. Uh, pre I presume so. He said, I, I want you to know I love you very much. And uh, I'm uh, calling you uh, from the plane. Uh, we've been taken over. There are three men that say they have a bomb. And I said, well, who are they, Mark? And uh, he said, he repeated that he loved me. And he said, I, I, I don't think he said, I don't know who they are. He just, he, he became distracted there as if someone was speaking to him. And he said, it's something to the effect of it's true. And, uh, and then the phone went dead. Authorities in New York City not giving up hope of finding more survivors. CNN producer Rose Arce is on the scene in lower Manhattan. Rose. I'm right across the street from Two World Trade Center, which is still surrounded by a plume of smoke. And in the foreground, you can see where uh, a, a building on BZ Street is still on fire. But for the first time tonight, we're actually seeing rescue workers inside Two World Trade Center. All day, they've been behind barricades, being pushed farther and farther back because of falling debris. And, and now, for the first time, they're actually on the catwalk that surrounds the uh, it's like right above the first story of World Trade Center. There's only about maybe seven or eight floors of the building left above them. It's just been shaved off at the top. It's completely blackened. The windows are darkened. There's really no sign of anything going on in there, but they're walking around in there. They're going through the windows. It looks like they have some access at least to, to what is the second floor now of the building and, and are looking around inside there. You can, you can see some flashlights. You can see someone walking around. Rose. You're describing the situation there for us very well, but there's no power in the area, is there? And this is indeed a very dangerous operation, isn't it? 
Yes, yes, there is. There actually is power in one building across the street. I don't know if it's a generator or... All right, we were talking... The entire area is only lit up by emergency lights. It, it's virtually a ghost town um, in lower Manhattan, uh, you know, except for just the area right around where the plane hit the building and where there is debris and, as I said, for the first time, an active rescue operation. How many people are in the building? Any idea? Uh, as far as rescue workers, I've only seen maybe a half pound, um, like I said, on, the, on this catwalk. And then down on the ground, there are just hundreds of firefighters that have reached here for the first time and are trying to clear through the debris in the adjoining buildings. There's also a, a triage center that's been set up across the street from Two World Trade Center where you can see several dozen people um, getting oxygen. There's, uh, there's some flying glass. There's this thin flying glass in the air that seems to be getting in people's eyes. So they're, there's people's right. eyes to try to clear them. All right, Rose R.C., CNN producer down at the scene in Lower Manhattan. And you know, all day the, the Red Cross had been calling on people to donate blood, to get out there, give blood, because so many people uh, have been injured. Jean Meserve is in Washington now, and we want to hand it over to her for a moment to talk about the Red Cross, how emergency services handle this kind of thing. Jean, where you go? Colleen, people in Washington and in New York and all across the country want to help in a situation like this. And this afternoon, the Federal Emergency Management Agency said the way to help was to contact the Red Cross and give them blood or give them money. And here with me today is Shelley McCaffrey. She's a Red Cross volunteer. Thanks for coming in. Hi, thank First, you. let's talk about the blood situation. How does it look right now? Have you gotten a lot of donations? We have had a wonderful response. And the truth is, blood donations are going to be needed in the long run. This is going to be an ongoing problem for many months, so it's important that people call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE and make an appointment and keep their appointment. And again, this will be many months. And people in Missouri can give blood and it will be as helpful as people exactly. in greater New York. Sure, they can contact their local blood region, make an appointment close to home, and if they call that 1-800-GIVE-LIFE, they can make that through that number. Why is the need for blood going to last for months, one right. can understand weeks certainly, but months. Right. Again, even if we use the blood that we have right now, it will need to be replenished and it will, it will be ongoing. We're going to have many, many months and of course we don't know what's going to happen. We are still in the middle of hurricane season and the Red Cross will be there through all other disasters, including this one. So it's so important to keep that blood supply going and to make sure that Red Cross is there to save lives every day through the next few months or however long it takes. Well, what about the cash donations? Are those flowing into you as well? Yes, it's wonderful to see the response of the American people at a time like this. It's so traumatic and people want to know how to help and the truth is turn to the Red Cross and be there for us so that we can be there for the American people. People can donate by contacting their local chapter. That's really the easiest way to go about it. Call the local chapter, look it up in the phone book, or contact the Red Cross at 1-800-HELP-NOW. You were mentioning that your website has just been flooded right. with people who want to help. It's wonderful, and in response to that flooding, America Online has also instituted helping.org in order to help the Red Cross and to funnel some of those donations through their website as well. So if you're having trouble with the Internet, that's an, another option to go in addition to redcross.org. But again, contacting the local chapter really is the most important way and the most effective way to, to get that donation to the Red Cross. What about people who want to volunteer their time? That's also a wonderful way to help out. However, the Red Cross has trained volunteers. It takes many hours of training. We want to make sure that we have the right people in the right place at the right time, ready to go whenever needed. So again, contact the local chapter. Look it up in the phone book. Make that call. Tell them that you want to volunteer, and they will put your name into our network of 23,000 volunteers nationwide. They'll give you the training, and then when you are needed, you'll be called upon. We've been talking today over and over about how unprecedented these events are. For the Red oh, yeah. Cross, is this also unprecedented? Absolutely. It's such a traumatic incident to have something like this happen right on the American soil, and we've been receiving such support from our international sister societies. It's just been it's just been incredible. It's so traumatic for the American people, so emotional and, and so deeply trying, but of course we will rise to the occasion. Tell me about that international mm -hmm. support. Right. The American Red Cross has been receiving calls of condolence and offers of support, whether it be financial or material, from our sister societies, the British Red Cross, the German Red Cross. 
And it, it's so it's so amazing to experience that international support in the same way that those other countries are supporting President Bush and are supporting the American government. We are also receiving that same support. And right here in America, it's so wonderful to see the people rally around that Red Cross, that symbol of help and hope that is the same worldwide. Shelley, before we leave, why don't you mm -hmm. once again give the uh, the phone numbers, the website, so sure. people can contact you. Everybody if they want can to. contact us at 1 800 HELP NOW to make that financial contribution. That's also available in Spanish, 1 800 257 7575. Or people can contact us at redcross.org or helping.org to make that online secure contribution. If people want to Give blood, 1-800-GIVE-LIFE, or contact that local chapter. Shelley McCaffrey mm -hmm. of the Red Cross, thanks so much for joining us here Thank today. You. Our coverage of the day's events and the aftermath will continue in just a moment. Stay with CNN. A day of unimaginable horror in the United States. A hijacked airliner smashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York. Minutes later, another jet slams into the South Tower. U.S. President George W. Bush is promising now that he's going to find the perpetrators as terrorist attacks on U.S. landmarks change the very landscape of American life. All right, we're going to continue on here, I think. We're supposed to have a little animation there, but let's keep going. All right, I'm Jim Clancy. And I'm Colleen McEdwards. We're going to continue CNN's coverage of the most devastating terrorist attacks ever to take place on American soil, continuing that coverage for you right now. It is now thought that several thousand people may have perished in New York and Washington on Tuesday. This is the new New York City skyline. Let's show it to you right now with an eerie void where the World Trade Center used to be. The twin 110-story buildings collapsed Tuesday after hijacked airliners crashed first into one tower, then into the other. A short while ago, we received pictures of that first plane that hit the North Tower. Actually, we don't have those pictures right now. We're just getting things sorted out here. Bear with us, but uh, 18 minutes later, in a terrorist operation of extraordinary precision, uh, a second airliner hits the South Tower, and we've been showing you video of that from a couple of different angles. Hundreds of people ran for their lives. Debris showered lower Manhattan. Well, you know, and as we look at the skyline now, Colleen, and see it darken, and we've heard reports that, yes, there are some rescue crews that have gone down into that area that uh, are looking for some of the debris. There's only about eight stories or even less remaining of uh, World Trade Center building number two. CNN's Th Deborah Feyerick reporting even that cadaver dogs haven't been able to do their jobs there because that coating of dust is so thick. Looking like a nuclear winter yeah. after this devastating strike, an audacious uh, strike involving the hijacking of four separate airliners in one single day. For the uh, cases that we know about, those hijackers were using knives or cardboard cutters, utility knives, uh, which actually a razor blade, perhaps in plastic, uh, perhaps that, uh, that the way that they got them through uh, the security checks at airports. But an incredible day. And actually, it, you know, one of, one of the things we've been hearing later this evening is that there's even maybe cell phone calls coming from that area. So still lots to sort out uh, in New York. But right now we want to go to CNN's Bill Hammer, who's got a look at, at the day's terrible events. Let's look. 8.45 a.m. East Coast time, an airliner smashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Minutes later, 9.03 a.m., a second jet slams into the South Tower. You can see the people jumping out the window. They're jumping out the window right now. Officials in New York close airports around the city. Tunnels and bridges shut down. At 9.30, President Bush tells the world the U.S. has been hit by an apparent terrorist attack. Within 10 minutes, the FAA shuts down every airport in the country, the first time this has ever happened. 9.45, an explosion at the Pentagon after another plane slams into the headquarters and the symbol of the U.S. military. 10 o'clock, New York City. The South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses, raining debris onto the street. Less than 30 minutes later, as evacuations continue, the North Tower falls. Here it comes. 
and getting behind a car. Gotta move back. In that same half hour, back in Washington, part of the Pentagon collapses. Further west, outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a plane crash reported in Somerset County. Plans go into effect to protect the government. Much of Washington is shut down. Federal buildings and the White House are evacuated. Members of Congress point to the possibility the attacks are the responsibility of Osama bin Laden, a Saudi millionaire blamed for other terrorist attacks. As part of emergency measures, the president cut short his trip in Florida, first making a stop in Louisiana, declaring the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible. He's later flown to Nebraska, where he convenes with security officials. 1.44 p.m., a state of emergency declared in Washington, D.C. Two U.S. Navy aircraft carriers and five other warships leave Norfolk, Virginia, headed to the New York City area. The FBI says it believes the four missing planes were hijacked and is working on the assumption the morning's events were a coordinated terrorist attack. Then about 6 o'clock Eastern time, explosions rock Kabul, capital city of Afghanistan. The White House denies this was any sort of retaliatory strike, but rather part of the ongoing civil war in that country. Bill Hemmer, CNN reporting. We have all witnessed over and over again in person or even on television in the United States or around the world, the incredible images of the tragedy that unfolded in Washington and New York City this day. Some of us are better than others at expressing the emotions that those images draw out of us. One of those who is good at it indeed is Garrick Utley. He joins us now from his city, New York. Well, Jim, uh, I feel like most of our colleagues uh, here today, and even those, those of you who have been watching this for, what, now nearly 16 hours, what can words really say? The fact is, we've been watching those images, those pictures. And perhaps we forget that behind each camera and each image is a camera person, a man or a woman who was there near the Pentagon or here in lower Manhattan. They were standing there. They are on the front line today, and they didn't flinch. What we want to do now is share again some of these images, but also with the words, the thoughts, and the experiences of that person who took those pictures. He's camera operator Tom Muccio, and here's what he saw and what he lived through today. When I started filming the Trade Center Towers this morning, I thought I had woken up in a nightmare. The flames, all these people running, trying to get out of Manhattan already. Then the first tower collapsed. Then day turned to night. A man turned up covered in soot, still carrying his briefcase. People were crying. Some just stood, not knowing where to go. I kept thinking about my family, my colleagues, whether they were all right, whether I would see them again. It felt like the end of the world. Then I looked and the second tower collapsed. It was gone. It looked like an exodus. People were coming out of nowhere covered in towels. A barman closed his bar in front of us. Today there would be no business as usual. Although somebody started to clean his fire escape around Wall Street. After we saw this woman call her family, we called ours too to let them know we were okay. People stopped to tell us what they saw. People are running their hair on fire. People were jumping out of the World Trade Center. Jumping out because they don't know what to do. So, I mean, they're dead by doing that. This man was taking this boy away from the scene. Their parents work in the big building. This couple was reunited and fine. We were invited into a hotel on Wall Street which was serving food in a makeshift room. We met the lucky ones too. This man overslept and he didn't get to work on time. He worked on the 78th floor of the World Trade Center. From what I understand, my whole office is dead. Everybody died up there, jumped out and were burned. When we got to Wall Street, the stock exchange was closed. The police were blocking our way. We found a policeman two blocks away from the World Trade Center who was guarding a piece of one of the planes. He was waiting for a forensic team to come and pick it up. I felt the nightmare was just carrying on. When we got closer to the World Trade Center, 
policemen were getting more and more nervous. Then we finally saw it, through the smoke. The remains of the World Trade Center looked like a broken fence. It felt like covering a volcano eruption, dust everywhere inches thick, pieces of paper covering the ground from the buildings. Again, it was three o'clock in the afternoon on Broadway. It felt like a very bad horror movie. On the way back to the office on the empty highway uptown, I thought about all this senselessness, about these terrible acts, and about the freedom to do evil. The pictures, the thoughts, the experiences this day of camera operator Tom Muccio, truly one of the real reporters on the front line of this tragedy. Back to you, Jim and Colleen. All right, Gary Cutley, thank you for that. Well, we want to show you once again some of the video, in case you've just tuned in, uh, video that is coming to light as the day wears on. That an angle of the second plane as it plowed into the World Trade Center that videotape perhaps because the cameraman was trapped down there in lower Manhattan and couldn't uh, make his way out just coming to us now terrifying awesome so much pain in a picture of what happened this day in New York City and indeed the pictures have been nonstop yeah, and that being United Airlines flight 175 65 people uh, on board that plane. Jean Meserve is in watching things in Washington for us tonight. Let's go to her for the very latest. Jean. Colleen, President Bush started his day in Florida but returned to the White House just as the sun was setting. The arrival designed to show that the United States leadership will not be cowed. A short while later, Mr. Bush addressed the American people and the world from the Oval Office. Let's listen to his full address. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature, and we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful, and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C. to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong, and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. 
I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Tonight, I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night, and God bless America. Following his address, Mr. Bush attended a national security meeting. CNN senior White House correspondent John King is perched on a building near the White House this evening. John, what happened at that meeting and what's happened since? Quite an extraordinary meeting, Gene. The president not only meeting with his national security, military and defense team, but also bringing into that meeting the transportation secretary, the secretary of health and human services, the federal emergency management director. All that because so, many, so much of this now proceeding on parallel tracks. On the one hand, the federal government taking extraordinary steps to make medical personnel, portable morgues and others available both in New York and at that scene over at the Pentagon. The investigation is also underway. We are told at that meeting by senior sources that it was discussed that the administration is building evidence that it believes points to people and groups associated with Osama bin Laden. The administration declining to say so publicly, but we are told by sources that was discussed at that meeting with the president and also has been discussed in private briefings senior administration officials have given members of Congress. Now, priority one for the president is to send reassuring signals to the American people that their government is at work during this investigation and during the recovery operations underway in New York and at the Pentagon. And to that end, we are told the president will bring the bipartisan leadership of Congress to the White House tomorrow for a public event. The rest of the president's schedule tomorrow and for the rest of the week on hold as the president obviously will be on hand at the White House to meet again with his national security team and assess anything he needs to do both to respond to what has happened here in the United States and we know there are troop deployments and other security precautions being taken overseas as well. Gene? John, any word about uh, the prospect of retaliatory strikes? We, you obviously heard the president is in his remarks saying if and when there are retaliatory strikes, they would not just be limited to the suspected terrorists, but also to anyone who harbors them. That taken, of course, is a signal to some that even the president was leaning a bit forward with the bin Laden connection. But I spoke to a senior official immediately after that session tonight who said, don't expect anything on an imminent basis. This official said, we're going to get this right. We're going to take a little time, he said, to sort this out. Gene? John, will life be different tomorrow for the president and also for average Americans in terms of security precautions? Life will be different for the president and the entire country. We have seen around the grounds of the White House behind me. It is dark in the complex now, but extraordinary security circumstances throughout the day. Indeed, as the president flew back to Washington today, if you looked out the window of Air Force One, you could see military fighter jets in very close proximity to Air Force One. And the president was brought back hours later than they had hoped. At one point, they wanted to bring the president directly back from Florida. Then he made a stop in Louisiana for a military base. They decided not to bring him back immediately because at that time, we are told, not all of the aircraft in the skies over the United States had been accounted for. The White House was not willing to bring the president back into Washington until all those aircraft had been accounted for and until other security steps were taken. Now, as for average Americans, we are told the plan is to reopen the nation's air traffic control system and therefore the nation's domestic air travel at noon tomorrow, barring any new troubling information overnight. Any American, though, going to an airport or a major train station in the days ahead, we are told, will see extraordinarily new, stringent security measures. Gene.
Senior White House correspondent John King, thank you. And now back to Jim Clancy in Atlanta. All right, Gene, thank you for that. Well, earlier we heard uh, what it was like for a professional cameraman on the scene at the World Trade Center this day, but what was it like to really witness the attack as an amateur, as someone who was there for another reason entirely? That's what happened with Dr. Mark Heath this day. He went to the scene to see if he could help the victims of the first attack, and he wound up being caught in the second. I live. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. It's uh, incredible. Okay, I'm gonna have to go find people who need help. But I don't think I'm one of them. You okay, sir? Okay. Can I just get a toot off your respirator? Yeah. Can I get a toot? Okay. I'm seeing a couple of clean breaths. Uh, that's good. Uh, okay. Back to you. This is the car I hid behind. It saved my life. Oh, wait, maybe it was this one. There's all these noises. I think it, I don't know what it is. They say someone needs help. Yeah, Mike! Mike! Mike, come over here! Yeah! Anybody need a doctor? Where are you? Don't have oxygen. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello, Doc. Hey, that guy needs some oxygen. If someone can share it with him. 10-4. Thanks. Side highway. You guys going in? Yeah. Come with you. You know, you might not want to get too much closer because the more buildings could come down, then we're not going to help anybody. All right. I think we should. Yeah. Where's the incident come out? Just, yeah, okay. Let's just wait right here. Let's just station up right here, okay? All right, Doc. Why don't we set up? Can you hang IVs from this pole here? Okay. Okay. Yeah. We just heard another explosion. 
They're handing out gloves and masks. The consensus is it's too unsafe to go in there. Just gonna wait here until they bring some people out. Hooked up with some firemen with some first aid stuff. What are we gonna you know do what? Anything? Why don't we just set this up as a little mobile hospital unit right here, okay? Suggestions should we set up here for medical work? Uh, think this is safe enough? And there we have it. One man's journey, an incredible journey through a day of disaster. That was amateur video from Dr. Mark Heath. Colleen. All right, Jim. Well, disaster relief agencies say they're rushing blood supplies to New York City and to Washington as well. People have been jamming donation centers to help the untold number of victims of these attacks. The American Red Cross says it has 60,000 units of blood in several East Coast cities that it can ship to hospitals in New York City and Washington. Even people on the other side of the country in Los Angeles have been lining up at blood donation centers. Authorities say they will continue to need donations, though, over the next two weeks, even longer, we're hearing now, perhaps even a couple of months, to replenish their supplies. Officials say the most needed blood types, O positive, O negative, they are the uh, universal blood types that can be transfused into anyone in an emergency. Now, at hospitals throughout the New York area, medical heroics are going on. Michael Oku is standing by at St. Vincent's Hospital and Medical Center, which is one of the trauma centers closest to the World Trade Center. Michael, go ahead. Colleen, they call this a city that never sleeps, and I'm sure that tonight in New York, no one is doing that. And yet, despite that, there is a very eerie silence that's broken across the city tonight, as you can well imagine, only occasionally broken by the sound of emergency medical vehicles. I'm standing in Lower Manhattan, just south of 14th Street, and if you can look just north of me, you can see that police have set up barricades so that no one can come below this part of uh, New York City. And it limits traffic to this part of New York City to just the occasional emergency medical vehicle and to police vehicles. I'm standing just about two blocks west of St. Vincent's Hospital, which has been set up as the main trauma and triage center here in New York as of 10.30 last night, which was the time of the last hospital press conference. Officials at St. Vincent's Hospital said that there were 327 patients who had been admitted 50 to 55 of them were in critical condition and they also reported of course that there were three deaths um, most of the victims they say had suffered from severe burns most of those burns had been burns that were sustained in the face uh, and there were occasional cases in which uh, patients uh, suffered from cardiac arrest some from existing conditions which were of course triggered by this trauma. Now Governor Pertaki was here earlier at St. Vincent's and he reported that he met with victims as well as some of the doctors who uh, worked on some of the patients here. He said that every story seemed to be uh, an unusual one and you can imagine there are no usual stories tonight. For the most part the scene outside the hospital looks like this. Dozens of men and women in scrubs, uh, under portable lights, uh, waiting. Uh, basically, gurneys that have been set up, wheelchairs, officer, off, uh, I should say office furniture covered in sheets as they await more victims, more people whose lives they are hoping to save. Uh, that's what the scene looks like outside St. Vincent's Hospital tonight. And what I have to report is probably one of the most eerie nights that I've spent in the city. The hospital says that they will have another briefing later this morning at 6.30. Back to you. All right, Michael Oku, thanks very much. Jim?
As America came under attack, so too did its financial sector. Wall Street virtually shut down this day because of the attacks uh, in New York City, as well as across the country when all airlines were sh uh, shut down. President Bush going on television to reassure not only Americans, but others who have an interest who share in the globalization uh, that has taken place within the financial world. And markets are reacting to the events in the United States yesterday. Let's go to Richard Quest. He joins us from London. Richard. Uh, many thanks, Jim. Of course, there was no trading in the United States, so the initial financial reaction has had to come from overseas. Europe saw very sharp falls as the news came in from New York and Washington. That's been followed up overnight in the Far East. Asian markets are down between around 6 to 10 percent, 10 percent in the Hong Kong market. The worry, of course, is clearly what this will mean for the wider issue of the economy. Uh, clearly, business will be seriously affected as well. Wall Street is paralyzed. Uh, simply those who can't even get to their offices uh, to do business, let alone uh, those who have actually been affected uh, by, the, by the crashes. Overall, nobody can really say at this point the extent to the economic uh, effect. We do know that the Fed is planning to pump money into the economy. That's designed not only to prevent a cash shortage, uh, ordinary consumers who may just be taking larger sums out of the bank, but also to prevent any form of credit crunch, Jim. All right. When you look at the markets, is there any way of telling how long lived this might be, this, this steep drop that you see in Asia right now? I think that one has to put this into two different categories. On the one hand, there is the, the, the markets reaction. That can unwind itself in a matter of days. That is simple panic. Uh, we've seen markets react before. Two weeks later, you wonder what, what had happened. Much more serious is the effect to business confidence. Bearing in mind, the World Trade Center has over 435 tenants in those two buildings alone. Uh, they come from more than 26 countries uh, around the globe. There were major financial institutions, Morgan Stanley, Keith Brett and Woods, uh, Credit Suisse First Boston, just some of those who are actually in the buildings. Now, taking away from that and moving slightly further afield, you've got, of course, the collapse of uh, number seven World Trade Center. You've then got all the other buildings nearby where people simply won't be able to get to work. The ripple effects will start to be felt. And that's why it's vital that people like Paul O'Neill, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, who's now leaving Japan and heading back to the United States, Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Fed, who's at a bankers' meeting in Basel in Switzerland, and the SEC, are all coordinating at the moment, not only uh, to send a message that they will provide the money necessary for corporate America to continue, but also to restore confidence in the market system. All right, Richard Quest reporting to us there from London. Colleen. All right, and of course, as we've been telling you all along, some of the rescue efforts still going on tonight, especially in New York City. And we've actually got some tape in just now that uh, we want to show you of those night rescue operations in and around the area of the World Trade Center. Just backing it up there a little bit. Let's see if we can get it rolling again. You can see uh, some of the areas that have been lit. Uh, we heard e earlier from a report from CNN's Deborah Farrick, who was down in that area, that they do have dogs there. They've got cadaver dogs searching. Uh, even that is being made difficult because there's so much dust on the ground. She was saying that, that even, the, even the dogs can't really do their work. So still a lot to sift through. There have been reports this evening of uh, telephone calls, cell phone calls being made possibly from the basement area of that uh, complex. None of that's uh, been confirmed, but of course, rescue officials uh, hoping and trying to see if there are people still alive. Uh, they want to be able to get them out. We heard later from, or earlier from the uh, New York mayor uh, that more than 300 firefighters they, they believe are missing and, and, and presumed dead, and, and dozens of police officers as well who were surrounding that building. Uh, when the two towers essentially crumbled, just crumbled into dust. So you're looking at some pictures there in and around the World Trade Center of the night rescue operation still underway at this time. And incredible pictures because really that's our best look really at the destruction that we've seen thus far because we've been, it was enveloped in, in clouds of dust 
for so long during the daylight hours, uh, very inaccessible, but you can see the way that the, the buildings are simply gone. All you see are the shell. Yeah, you see a few floors there, Jim, just a few, obviously badly burnt out. But having worked there, and you know, CNN had its New York bureau in the World Trade Center right. uh, when the network first started on the air 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. And when I look at those pictures, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to believe. And as many people have noted on this day, there's a sense uh, among the people in the United States that there has to be retribution for this. The death toll alone is going to be staggering. We've been warned about that. No one even knows, no one can even estimate. Uh, although United States officials say there have been no credible claims of responsibility for Tuesday's attacks in New York City and Washington. And, and they remind everyone it's still too early to speculate about exactly who may be involved. Still, some U.S. intelligence officials are telling CNN there are good indications, that's their words, that people linked to Saudi exile Osama bin Laden might be responsible. As the World Trade Center burned furiously, smoke billowed above the Pentagon, and the White House was evacuated, one security expert declared, this isn't an act of terrorism, this is an act of war. Noting there was no direct evidence, several experts pointed out that few terrorist organizations around the world were capable of mounting such an audacious attack. They mentioned only one man by name, a name repeated by U.S. officials for years. There is not the slightest doubt that Osama bin Laden, his worldwide allies, and his sympathizers are planning further attacks against us. Despite progress against his networks, bin Laden's organization has contacts virtually worldwide, including in the United States, and he has stated unequivocally that all Americans are targets. For almost a decade, Osama bin Laden has been accused or suspected of coordinating attacks on the United States, on U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia, on U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, in the suicide mission against the USS Cole at the World Trade Center in 1993. And the list goes on. Terrorism experts paint a picture of bin Laden as a Saudi-born revolutionary determined to end U.S. involvement in Saudi Arabia. In interviews, bin Laden has renewed his vow to bring jihad, or holy war, against the United States. Specifically, he said Washington had failed to get the message from bombings aimed at U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. We declared a jihad, a holy war, against the United States government because it is unjust, criminal, and tyrannical. Terrorism analysts warned earlier this year Osama bin Laden was turning his attention to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, hoping to win armed converts and gain global political momentum out of the chaos of the collapsed peace process. Bin Laden's wealth, estimated by some at around $200 million, is seen as key to not only recruiting militant followers, but funding carefully planned and coordinated attacks. U.S. officials blame Osama bin Laden in the attacks on the U.S. embassies in Nairobi, Kenya, and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, which they say were carefully timed to increase the dramatic effects of a simultaneous onslaught against U.S. interests. Get the cameras out of here! Let's go! Get off! It is precisely the same strategy that appears to be at work in the financial and political centers of America in the latest attacks. U.S. officials assert that bin Laden initiated his terrorist network during the war in Afghanistan, later moved to training bases in Sudan, and is currently being sheltered by Afghanistan's ruling Taliban. The Taliban say they have been warned the U.S. will hold Afghanistan responsible for any attack on U.S. interests linked to bin Laden. There are governments like Afghanistan, which are engaged in uh, the smuggling of um, heroin uh, and the harboring of terrorists. Uh, and uh, you know, governments such as Afghanistan, I think, have to be considered criminal organizations. Sanctions against Afghanistan are already in place. U.S. missile strikes hit bin Laden's training facilities there in 1998, but missed the 44-year-old leader of an organization he simply calls the base. Earlier this year, reporters who visited bin Laden in Afghanistan said he appeared to be in a race against time, a race to see who could strike first, the United States or Osama bin Laden. 
It may be weeks or months before those behind what is apparently the worst terrorist strikes in the history of the U.S. are known. What is certain is that Osama bin Laden is already high on the list of suspects. One Arab journalist says Osama bin Laden warned three weeks ago that he and his followers would carry out an unprecedented attack against the United States. He's joining us now. Abdul Bari Atwan, editor of the London-based Al-Quds newspaper, uh, joining us from London. Tell us a little bit more about this warning. There have been many others, haven't there? Well, actually, um, you know, I believe this uh, could be a work of consortium of many organizations, Islamic organizations, which they declared war against the United States. You know, the anti-American feeling gets very high now in the Middle East and the Muslim world because what's happening on uh, the occupied territories. And many people accuse the United States of actually helping the Israeli and protecting them. So um, the groups like bin Laden and other Islamic fundamentalists, actually, they would like to uh, come out and say, look, you know, we are targeting the United States. The United States is supporting the Muslim and Arab enemies, which is the Israeli, and we are taking revenge of what's happening. So we, we learn from uh, sources that, you know, they are really in, um, at work to uh, hit the American uh, target. But nobody expected that this target will be in New York itself or in uh, the Pentagon. So uh, uh, the place of the attacks was surprising to everybody. Abdul Bari, Osama bin Laden has been said to be really trying to turn Afghanistan not only into a, a, what he would term a pure Islamic state, but into a base, a, a base where uh, there are people who would support exporting, if you will, his brand uh, of Islamic revolution. Well, actually, you know, uh, I, I interviewed uh, Osama bin Laden on Afghanistan in November 1996, and uh, I did see uh, his camps and uh, his followers there. You know, the man is uh, ruthless, and, uh, you know, he believes that he should declare war against the United States. And this kind of appeal, uh, this kind of call actually appealed to many young Muslims all over the world. And uh, the, he recently, he managed to recruit a lot of those uh, highly educated Arabs who were even educated in the United States itself and some Western countries. So I'm not surprised if he is surrounded with experts in different fields. And we noticed that the attack against the American destroyer coal in the seaport of Aden was highly sophisticated attack, highly sophisticated on the bombing, uh, the uh, information gathering, and uh, the monitoring of the movement of the American warships. So I'm not surprised if those highly intelligent people, highly educated people, actually were behind the planning of the attacks against the World Trade Center. You know, when people look at this and they see it in, in the narrow confines of, of one day, people saw Palestinians standing up and cheering these attacks in Nablus, in refugee camps in South La Lebanon where they've languished for half a century. When they look at that, on one hand, it creates a sense of anger. And there has to be a sense as well from some among the Arab world that this is not going to lead to an improvement in the situation and certainly not a change in the U.S. position. Jim, you are absolutely right, but we have to put into our consideration there are 300 million Arabs, and those people are very few who actually were dancing in the streets, whether in Nablus or in refugee camps in, in, in Lebanon. The Palestinians definitely will, will suffer because of these attacks, because they want the American involvement in the peace process to be revived, and they want the American to be the sponsor of the peace process and to intervene and put an end to the Israeli aggression against their people there. So uh, we cannot say those people representing the Arabs, but you know, we have to ask our questions, you know, why America is targeted, why the American people are targeted. Definitely there is something wrong in the American foreign policies. So these, these wrongs has to be readdressed, has to be rectified. And we want more involvement uh, from the United States on the Arab-Israeli conflict to revive the peace process, to put an end to the Israeli atrocities. Also, there are Palestinians killed in the West Bank and Gaza Strip every day by the Israeli tanks, by the Israeli missiles. So we have to understand and the frustration of some people. But this doesn't mean that we should support any terrorist acts against innocent American in New York, and Washington, anywhere in the world. They, it right. is a terrorist act. Everybody condemned in the Middle East. Abdul Bari Atwan uh, of Al-Quds, our thanks to you for being with us there. Colleen? All right, Jim, thanks. I want to uh, show you some tape again now that we're just getting in. We're just starting to get some, some nighttime footage rolling in of, of the efforts uh, that are going on there.
this is the rubble around the World Trade Center, and actually, maybe I need to be corrected. That doesn't look like it's nighttime. Perhaps that's from earlier in the day. John, maybe you can just let me know for sure. Uh, regardless, that is the rubble uh, around the area of the World Trade Center. You can clearly see parts of building. All that dust that rained down, all the debris. Uh, in that debris, we saw earlier sheets of paper from uh, the offices in there only a few floors of that building remaining standing. Still a, a fair bit of dust there. We saw p in pictures uh, from nighttime just a few minutes ago that a lot of that dust has settled. Rescue workers on the scene. And there you see them there. New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani saying uh, 300 or more firefighters believed uh, are missing, believed, believed dead, and, and dozens of, of police officers as well. All right, those pictures obviously from earlier of the rubble around the World Trade Center. Jim? Devastation this day also in the nation's capital. Let's go now to the Pentagon and Bob Franken live for an update on the situation there, Bob. Well, it's been about 16 hours, Jim, since the, uh, the explosion here, since the plane collided with uh, this west side of the Pentagon. And you can see it's still smoldering a little bit. Uh, they're still waiting, waiting for the embers to stop uh, going so they can actually go into the building. Uh, we saw just a moment ago some of the supervisors. They were lowered in what looked like a bucket. They were actually being lowered into the, the bombed out building where the plane had hit so they could take a look and just see what the status of the fire was. The plan is at daybreak to literally peel away the wall a little bit and uh, then go in. Of course, uh, about 15 hours ago, we we had some video that was shot uh, shortly after the plane had collided with this side of the building. You can see that there was quite a bit of uh, firefighting effort going on. There were literally hundreds of firefighters going. Uh, they were trying to put out a blaze that uh, still going till now. Uh, they fought all day uh, with this, and of course there was also an evacuation of the injured. We don't have any sense of the casualties yet. Uh, we've been told that it couldn't, they could number in the hundreds. There could be more than 100 dead. There are wide estimates. The Pentagon is not giving any estimate. Perhaps we'll know more tomorrow when officials are actually able to go inside the building. A uh, plane, of course, collided shortly after 9.30 this morning. A plane that was flying from Dulles, and of course it was taken by hijackers. Uh, that is the report, of course, and uh, was then moved into the Pentagon causing the damage that it did. Now, people talk about retaliation and uh, the Pentagon is already thinking about that and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff says that he will have the forces necessary. I extend my condolences to the entire Department of Defense families, military and civilian, and to the families of all those throughout our nation who lost loved ones. I think this is indeed a reminder of the tragic, the tragedy and the tragic dangers that we face day in and day out, both here at home as well as abroad. I would tell you up front, I have no intentions of discussing today what comes next, but make no mistake about it, your armed forces are ready. And tomorrow they will be ready to open the Pentagon. It's become a matter of pride here. At least they're going to be opening part of the building. The defense secretary said he's determined to do that to prove to the world that terrorism cannot knock down a building, cannot knock down the spirit of the American military. Jim? Bob, the toll of dead and injured there at the Pentagon, does anyone know for sure? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, the Pentagon is quite assertive about the fact that no estimates can be made. There was a local fire chief who said that the deaths could range between 100 and 800. Pentagon officials think that that is way too high, the 800 number, but it is clearly possible that there could be deaths that number in the hundreds. All right, Bob Franken reporting there live from the Pentagon. Colleen? All right, Jim, the attacks brought much of the United States to a halt as people watched events unfold transfixed. Schools, offices were closed. Highways across the country fell into gridlock as thousands of people returned to the sanctuary of their homes. But nowhere was the sense of shock so profound as in Manhattan. Greg Clarkin has that. 
The terror attacks on the World Trade Center paralyzed New York and brought life to a standstill across America. Manhattan was sealed off minutes after the attacks on the Twin Towers. Tunnels and bridges closed. Subway and commuter rail service suspended. Hundreds of thousands of people staggering out of the financial district on foot on highways usually clogged with cars. Many scrambled to call loved ones only to find pay phones and cell phones rendered useless. The World Trade Center was a major hub of telecom equipment and call volume swamped phone networks. Manhattan supermarkets were jammed and long lines formed at cash machines. New York City police precincts were sealed off and an urgent plea for blood was issued as hospitals throughout the metropolitan area were pressed into service. Right now, at the last, at last count, we were utilizing over 50. I think it'll be over 100 by the... By the and that was, a, that, that was as of a half hour ago. And we're utilizing all of the hospitals in New York City, we're utilizing the hospitals in Westchester and Rockland, Nassau County, northern New Jersey. For the first time in United States history, airports across the country were shut down, and they'll stay that way until at least noon on Wednesday. The Federal Aviation Administration ordered all airports closed and all planes which were in the air were directed to land at the nearest airport. Transportation Secretary Mineta has directed the Federal Aviation Administration to suspend operations until at least noon tomorrow. Amtrak canceled train service between New York and Boston. Greyhound canceled a big chunk of its service as well. Government buildings and businesses across the country were evacuated. Security tightened along the U.S. border with Mexico and Canada. NASA shut its centers down, and even some offshore oil drilling in the Gulf of Mexico is suspended. Stock trading was canceled, and financial markets will be closed all day Wednesday. Major League Baseball canceled its schedule for the first time since FDR's death in 1945, and for only the fourth time in its history. The NFL is considering canceling Sunday's games. Across the U.S., tourist attractions and landmarks shut down. Disneyland, Disney World, and Seattle Space Needle among them. Back in New York, the mayoral primary election was also canceled. Greg Clark in CNN, New York. All right, for some insight now into how Americans view the attacks, CNN, USA Today, and Gallup conducted a public opinion poll just before the president's speech. 86% of those questions said they considered the events an act of war. But the majority agreed the U.S. military should not strike back until it is clear who is responsible for the attacks. And 78 percent said they were confident of President Bush's ability to handle this situation. Some relatives of the people killed had to deal with this attack right as it was happening. A man on board one of the planes called his mother as the aircraft was being hijacked. And this is so upsetting, I can't tell you. Mark Bingham. A passenger on United Airlines Flight 93 that was en route from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco. He called his mother just minutes before the plane crash near Pittsburgh. Well, that I love you very, very much in case I don't see you again. I said that. That the plane has been taken over by hijackers. And, um, and then I said, well, we love you very much too, Mark. Let me go get your mother. I got on the phone, Mark. Um, and he said, hi, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. <laughs> Give me his last name. And uh, he said, I want to let you know that I love you. And I'm, uh, I'm uh, flying. I'm, I think he said, I'm in the air. I'm calling you uh, on the air phone of the airplane. In his seat. Uh, I presume so. He said, I, I want you to know I love you very much, and uh, I'm uh, calling you uh, from the plane. Uh, we've been taken over. There are three men that say they have a bomb. And I said, well, who are they, Mark? And uh, he said, he repeated that he loved me, and he said, I, I, I don't think he said, I don't know who they are. He just, he, he became distracted there as if someone was speaking to him. And he said, it's something to the effect of it's true. And, uh, and then the phone went dead. An emergency dispatcher in Pennsylvania where United Flight 93 crashed said that he received a call from a passenger on board the plane as well. And that man repeatedly said, we are being hijacked. We are being hijacked. Jim. Millions of people all around the world remained riveted to their television screens for hours once they heard about the attacks. Ann McDermott has more on the U.S. public's reactions to what they were watching. The pictures were just so insane that all these University of Southern California students could do was stare. 
But the younger ones had questions, lots of questions. But when I first saw on the news, I sort of wondered how protected we really are in America. Think they'll be able to catch all the people involved. Their teacher, for once, had no answers. How, 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 why, why, why? These are the questions. And here's one more. Do you think anything like this would ever happen again? Will it happen again? Psychologists say that's what can make people so crazy at first. It's not that we're afraid of the unknown. In the face of the unknown, we fill it in. We think there are monsters out there, and we actually end up frightening ourselves more. Many of these people in an L.A. area gym admitted they were frightened and came here only for something to do. I'm looking at the streets, and it looks like Beirut, and I can't believe it's my backyard. The smoke continues to fill out of the Trade Center building six hours. I think we're definitely going to go to war. This Korean war vet sure hopes not, but he knows the feeling. I see what it says right there. America under attack. People didn't have to die. But they did die. And America's in mourning. Ann McDermott, CNN, Los Angeles. All right, we are uh, actually coming to the end of this hour of coverage of America under attack. It has been about 16 hours since all of this horror began. The attacks on New York and Washington Tuesday, September 11th, will never be forgotten by those, to, those who experienced them firsthand or by the millions of people around the world who actually saw them unfold. I heard the sound of a jet. Um, I assumed it was like a, you know, a Navy jet or something like that just flying by. Yeah, we heard a big bang, and then we saw smoke coming out, and everybody started running out, and we saw the plane on the other side of the building, and there was smoke everywhere. Then I heard a large explosion. I thought it was a sonic boom. And when I heard the explosion, I looked up, and what I saw was I saw red, and I saw actually started, saw debris to start to fall down. As soon as the building, as soon as it got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky to get out. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. It was an enormous fireball. It was fire debris falling to the ground, and then just a whole kind of mushroom of smoke that sort of just billowed up. And, um, and I, we just, I just stood there in absolute disbelief. There was a lot of people hurt. They were lying on the floors, coming down the stairs. A lot of people had asthma attacks while they were coming down. It was, it was bad. Everybody was screaming. Everybody was running. The cops were trying to maintain the calm. And in that haste, people were stampeding. People started screaming that there was another plane coming. I didn't see the plane, but I turned around, and it just the second building just exploded. And we see a second commercial jet flying extremely low actually collide into the south tower of the building. Um, at that point, we decided just to get out of there. And people were just going crazy at that point, evacuating. I saw people jumping out of, off the building. Many, many people just jumping. And people were just uh, climbing. Uh, they were just falling down. I saw about six people falling down from the building from the binoculars. I saw a lady with a black suit. She fell down, and a boy with a white shirt. He fell down, and it was horrible. If you go over by there, you can see the people jumping out the window. They're jumping out the window right now. Oh, my God. Everybody was on top of each other trying to come down, and then somebody finally calmed the crowd down to get them to come down the stairs in an orderly fashion and get them out of the building. We saw the, um, the, the South Tower collapse to the ground, decimated, and then later, the, it was very amazing to see the North Tower standing there by itself after years and years and years of seeing them together. And then all of a sudden, the North Tower just collapsed upon itself and just fell to the ground. It was a cloud of dust that covered all of um, downtown Manhattan. These New York policemen and firemen, God bless them, they kept us calm. They tried so hard to keep us moving north, and it was just absolute, absolute horror. It was horror. Now, those are the words from the day America came under attack. Let's take a look at some of the pictures of the day of the damage that has been done as a demarcation line is crossed, in the words of some, a line that separates past from future in the way that the U.S. is likely to deal with terrorism and the realization, above all, that it is not isolated, that it is not safe because it is sheltered between two oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific. Many people that you heard, their voices there, never believed they would see these kinds of scenes as a result of a deliberate act of violence. But that is indeed what was witnessed 
in New York City, in Washington on this day, people believing that the security that had been in place would prevent these kinds of scenes. The utter destruction of two of the landmark buildings in New York City at the very heart of the financial district, symbols of, as some would say, of capitalism, of America's financial strength. But they were laid low this day by two hijacked jetliners that were plowed into the side at a horrible cost in human life. The news continues now on CNN.